Okay, folks, we're back and part two of our discussion of Robert Louis Gabney. And this is going to be about uh, 15 or 20 minutes long to try to make it a little, a little bit more um, uh, meaty in how we're talking about not just who is Robert Louis Gabney, but what did he believe? What did he teach? What was he about in his method of, of going about philosophy and theology as a churchman, as a Christian, as a statesman? Um, what kind of public theologian was he? And that's where we're going to see his problems um, and also some of his brilliance. Um, as well. And, and again, uh, there, there, a lot of people want to write people off in our day. Um, and uh, I, I don't I don't really know that the culture should be leading us in how we decide who is in and who is out. OK, we need to focus ourselves on what does the Bible have to say? If the Bible says something that you're off on, the Bible needs to rebuke you and, and you need to be open to that rebuke. Um, but if if not, you know, to be honest, who cares what culture has to say, to be honest? So, so we need to we need to evaluate thinkers based upon the Word of God, not what the current climate is in in uh, the day. Um, now, as a public theologian, Dabney has moments of brilliance and moments of what you know, and, and so we need to be honest about those things without overreacting, and also I think laudably show uh, what great philosophy in many ways, and also uh, great theology he did have um, in his thinking uh, that, that is commendable as well. And again, I think I think if we take our cues from culture primarily, we're going to struggle with a lot of theologians uh, before the, the 20th century. We just will. We just are going to. Um, we have a lot of our own problems in our own days as well um, that, that I think it, it, it's, we have what, the tendency for what uh, C.S. Lewis called a chronological snobbery, right? Where we think somehow we're more evolved and we're more righteous than people were in the past. And I think that that is a dangerous, prideful place to be. And we need to be weary, um, weary of that kind of mentality. Okay. Uh, so we want to come into the discussion of Dabney's thinking with, with some honesty, but also without this overreactionary, um, um, I think, approach as well. Uh, so, so first, let's just kind of go through very quickly the literature on Dabney. We already kind of shared with you um, the, the two biographies that are most well known, the one by Thomas Gary Johnson, the one by Sean Michael Lucas in the last video. I'm going to very quickly share with you his his um, his work on preaching, uh, which is called in, uh, Evangelical Eloquence, what it was titled by uh, Banner. Uh, Banner published this one. Very, very good on, on his public, uh, public lectures on preaching was a preacher from 1847 through 1853 at Tinkling Springs Presbyterian Church in Virginia. Helped to, as an architect, build that building. Uh, fascinating, uh, you know, in, in that, that he was a real, truly a Renaissance man. Helped build churches, uh, kind of in that Southern architectural uh, um, uh, vein that he had. He was a very brilliant man in many, many respects, um, but was also a great preacher in his own right. Uh, many, many thought of him as a very powerful preacher of the gospel in his day, though he's not as well known for that, even in his time was not as well known for that. Definitely not today known for that, but he was known for that in his day as that he was a powerful preacher and was a uh, effect, effective preacher of the gospel and had a, had a short revival in his church, uh, uh, bringing 30 or 35 people to, to the Lord in a season uh, uh, of preaching. Uh, in, in, in a rural Virginia town, that's a lot. That's a big revival, actually. Uh, so he's well known as a preacher, uh, and he was a pastor for a number of years, though he was obviously a professor primarily uh, for 30 plus 40 years or so um, after that from, uh, oh, 1853 to the end of his life, you know, 1898. So was a was a pastor for a short period of time was a professor and a theologian and a public theologian for 40 plus years, actually. His two important books on philosophy um, are these two right here, The Practical Philosophy and The Sensualistic Philosophy of the 19th Century. Um, I, will, I will commend to you both of them, but the first one, The Practical Philosophy, is, um, is, a, is a better general book for, for, the, for the layperson to read. Um, this book right here. You can buy it for $10 from Sprinkle Publications. Sprinkle publishes everything cloth bound, very cheap and, and affordable to buy. Um, but, you know, th this goes over everything from some centralistic philosophy that he critiques um, to also going through, and he spends his most time on that. 
But to talk about rational sensibilities, he talks about the free will, the really good chapters on the free will. He talks about the love of applause. He talks about social affections, moral feelings. He talks about um, the faculty of the will. He spends a lot of time on these things. And again, this is a very impactful book. And you can read small sections of it and, and feel like you're really kind of getting nourished with what he has to say. So I, I'd commend that one over the sensualistic philosophy, though that one is his um, favorite and his most professed uh, book as as his best book, even considering his um, systematic theology, he thinks the sensualistic philosophy is his best book. And I've read a, a lot of that book so far, and I will tell you it's the hardest book of his, without a doubt. Um, but it, it I can see why he thinks this is best. It's his it's most tightly argued, most refined arguments, um, very academic in a lot of ways too, but very, very good and, and needed because as Charles Taylor calls, you know, what's called the social imaginary today, where people just kind of intuit their beliefs instead of actually reason through them, right? In the social imaginary, the sensualistic philosophy of the 19th century is richly involved, right? Paganism, essentially. Materialism, he shows how sensualism, which is basically sensory perception, everything is experience, everything that is true is what I experience or don't experience. And from that, it's impressed upon my mind what is true, what is not true, which leads me to materialism. Instead of understanding the, that the conscience and, and the spirit of the person uh, is rational, uh, is conscious, is responsible, is aware of, of universals and necessary truths. And because of that, my sense is more of an impression of that consciousness and those universals in an occasioned fashion than those senses are telling me exactly what is true or what not what is not true so uh you know call, calls it the universals and the occasions you know again yeah, kind of the the philosophical language that that sometimes can can throw us awry there but very 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 helpful if you want to read that um and again this collection of books this is called his discussions fairly well known um fairly cheap to buy to be honest for what how much uh, stuff is in there you can see sprinkle again publishes this uh, reformed and presbyterian publisher and I mean, it's just, they're so good. You, you can read anything. This is where most of his public theology comes in, or most of that's published with, you know, his theological, evangelical, and philosophical, and 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 uh, moral philosophy, again, is his main focus. Not philosophy like we would think of it, though it's that's in there, but more moral, ethical philosophy is what's in there. You're going to find that's where you'll, you'll see a lot of his problems um, with, with um, racism, uh, definitely a, a problem in his thinking. Uh, though not not a um, th though he has a, a view of racism, I would say uh, that is um, while, while problematic and wrong, um, really sees he, he's he's not on the he's not as uh, Jerdo was. Jerdo was was known as a friend of the African American uh, church. Uh, Dabney, I don't think was seen as a friend, but I don't think he was seen as an enemy per se. Uh, but he has uh, problematic views on racism for sure. Um, and I, I would say also problematic views on hierarchy in the home. Um, I, I don't believe the Bible teaches hierarchy in the home. I think the Bible teaches complementarianism in the home. Some people would say, well, I'm a complementarian, but they kind of really are hierarchical, actually. Um, the Bible seems to, to be very clear that, that, that the uh, authority that is vested in people to rule and to reign and to lead leads to servanthood. It doesn't lead to, you know kingship and lordship over people okay uh, we see jesus doing this with his disciples and apostles uh, at the last supper and as he washes their feet so we see the king washing feet uh, benjamin Por uh, benjamin morgan palmer gets this better than dabney does and i think dabney is really really off both in his racism and also in the problem of his um his uh his understanding of the home in the orders of the home i think are, are problematic um, but but Palmer says in his great book, The Family, also published by Sprinkle, that there are varying degrees of submission, okay? So beginning with Ephesians 5.21, we're all in mutual submission to one another as brothers and sisters. That's one degree or one level of submission. Then it goes to children and parents. Then it goes to the wife, to the husband. But the greatest submission, the greatest degree of submission is the husband to Christ, so notice that it's led by example. The exemplar is Christ himself and everyone else behind that, like a train, has varying dif differing levels of degrees of submission. 
with the husband being the one to have the greatest. So to me, that's really what the Bible is teaching um, with, with giving order to the home. Um, so a complementarian view here, but very much not hierarchy, <laughs> which is what I think Dabney very much is believing in and teaching. And I don't, I just don't, again, I don't think he was a domineering, terrible individual of any kind, but I just don't think that view lends itself to humility. Um, and I, I think there, there's a big problem biblically with that from Ephesians 5, seems to be calling that out. But again, his racism is just, un, you can't defend it. It's not defendable. It's wrong. Um, however, he's, he's, he's not a, uh, he's not pictures of what I think people would paint him as um, he, he's not some big plantation owner or something like that. Okay. But at the same time, it's still sin. Okay. His public theology in this area is wrong. He's, he's absolutely sinful in this area. So we need to be honest about that without overreacting to that too. Um, we need to see him in his flaws. I, I don't think he was the best biographer of Stonewall Jackson either. So he has problems. He, he has problems honest with, with his views on statehood. Um, he was almost more of a Virginian than sometimes he felt he was a Christian or something. He had such a high view of his state that it was almost it was almost nationalistic in the way that he thought, and that that's a problem too. You know, the, the Christian is a dual citizen. We're not to over indulge into our citizenship here on earth. I think he did. Uh, I think when the South lost the war, he he almost went into a depression with with the loss of of that identity of of as a Virginian. So I think some of his other problems are 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 as problematic as the racism that he was a part of. Um his his overindulgence into his statehood, his problems with his his uh familial hierarchy that he taught. Um I, I think those are issues that we need to be honest about that that we don't need to follow him there. We need to resist that. Uh, B.B. Warfield was much better on a lot of those areas. And so there are other better examples to follow there. But at the same time, I don't want us to react in a way that we throw Dabney out because there's so much that we can learn from him in his theology and philosophy that's very, very good and very, very helpful. So let's not underreact, okay? But let's not overreact either as we want to learn from this person, okay? And we're going to find, again, uh, think, you know, pre-20th century, we're going to find a lot of problems with a lot of Christian thinkers that we need to be aware of. Um, and and we, we need to, again, not underreact. But we also don't need to overreact as well. We need to remember the culture doesn't set the tone. The Bible sets the tone. Where the Bible says that we're off, we need to be in exposed and, and judged. We need to respond to that with humility and repentance and trust that Christ, both as our atoning sacrifice, but also as our leader, our exemplar, we need to be more like him. Okay? So I want to make a real strong delineation there that, that it's not culture that should lead us, okay? It's Christ of and over that culture that should lead us. And Dabney's wrong on a number of those areas, and we need to call him out on that. But we also need to make sure that we don't overreact and push aside his brilliance in other areas that we can glean a lot from, okay? And then lastly, there's two books um, that I, I think are really helpful. The Penal Substitution of Christ here, Christ the Penal Substitute, is absolutely brilliant. It's a brilliant book on the substitutionary work as um, uh, of Christ. And, and I, I will read to you very quickly um, a little a little discussion he has about uh, potential and actual guilt. And this is kind of a little excerpt to show you his brilliance, okay, as a philosopher, theologian. And then we'll talk about his systematics at the very end. He says this in his definitions and statements of the issue of where people bring up all these issues, right? That the penal substitution of Christ is violent and it's it's wrong and it's it's God's not like that. God's just love, kind of that kind of stuff. That's always been around, okay? So this is how he argues. He says, no, there are, there's potential guilt. Our sin is conscious and spontaneously discrepant from the righteousness of God. Our righteousness in a, is an intelligent and hearty compliance to be so with the will of God. And sin is a conscious and spontaneous discrepancy from that, okay? So he's describing it in a legal sense here, okay? Not like the Catholics do, which is an existentialist understanding, but a legal moral understanding of sin. And then he, def he defines sin in two categories that have a relationship, but he gives a distinction. He says this, first, potential guilt is the ill desert of merit or merit of punishment attaching to the transgressor by reason of his sin. Where we judge that an agent has sinned, we also judge that he has made himself worthy of penalty. So potential guilt is someone who has sinned actually, 
and has made themselves worthy of penalty, but it doesn't necessarily mean they were they they get the recompense of that penalty right then. Okay, that's where actual guilt comes in. And he says this: actual guilt is the debt of penalty to law arising out of the transgression. It is the penal enactment of the lawgiver where he ascertains and fixes that guilt, sets the the sets the penalty. Okay, hence. Under a lawgiver who is less than omniscient, so just a normal magistrate of some kind, a normal officer of peace, right? A normal officer of the law. He says, who is less than omniscient and all perfect, there might be sin, evil, attribute, and potential guilt, but no actual guilt was present. So actual guilt is absent. So the penalty is not exacted by those people. People can kind of feel like they get free, that the law is not applied to them, right? Okay. <clears throat> It thus appears that while evilness or sinfulness is an attribute, actual guilt is not an attribute, but a relationship, okay? It is a personal relation between a sinning agent and the sovereign, which will legislate that penal uh, statute. It is this relation only which is transferred or counted over from the sinning person to his substitute. So he, see how he's arguing very technically here, philosophically, biblically, theologically for the need for the substitute so it's actually given to us he's saying is not the you know the, the potential guilt but the actual guilt that the penalty that rises from our sin is given to the substitute it also shows that just because someone sins and there's a worthiness of penalty doesn't mean they receive it until the relationship between them and the judge is encountered okay so again there's just this is in you know two little paragraphs but it shows how much is going on in his mind there's a lot going on and i think that book is outstanding it's a very technically challenging book to read but it's short and you'll you'll be benefited a lot from it lastly of course is his systematic theology which is really the magnum opus and it was published first by banner back in 1985 and has been uh, done so ever since and i will say that this this theology is really 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 good okay uh i'll give you two or three highlights of the pros and then i'll give you a couple drawbacks but the first is this it is a philosophical biblical theological work okay it is not as much historical or overtly okay just bible proof texts okay um he is using a whole lot of of philosophy and moral philosophy, and he's arguing philosophically much of the time. Um, he's also arguing apologetically much of the time. So Dabney is not a proof texter, uh, maybe as, as some of you might might have read through different volumes. He's not a big proof texter, okay? He does use scriptural texts, but he really argues reasonably for doctrines a lot first. And there's there's pushback on that from me and also praise from me. And I think sometimes the pushback's too much, but Pushback is this, is that sometimes Dabney has a little bit too much of a reliance on reason and consciousness. Oh, I wouldn't say over, but in equality to revelation, almost in a sense like Thomas Aquinas does, you know, a little too close on evenness of scale of reason, human reason and revelation. But he sees human reason, of course, as a gift from God. And I think the reason he, he focuses so much on that is because I think he's trying to argue and maybe rightfully so here. That natural theology should lead us to theism. Okay, I'll say that again. I think he's arguing most of the time that natural theology, what God gives us in our consciousness, our conscience, and the witness of creation, should lead us faithfully to theism. Okay, that God is judge, that God is eternal, right? Romans 1 and 20. That God is good, that God is sovereign, right? That God is all powerful. I think it should lead us to this idea. That the sovereign king is 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 the sovereign over me, and so natural theology is what I think he he sees reason arguing towards that, and being a very sure witness to God being judge. Okay, I think that's where he's coming from. I don't think he's trying to reason his way to heaven or salvation or anything like that. Uh, certainly not. But I think he's trying to 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 milk out of natural theology everything it's supposed to give us. Okay, so I think for that reason he's very apologetic. He's very philosophically rigorous, um, and I think he's very, very helpful in a world that really needs good thinking, right? Um, it, it doesn't know how to think anymore. 
it's all about feeling, you know, and, and it's all about, you know, experiences or, or, you know, intuition. I think he's going to give us a sure footing on how to witness to people in just reasonable ways, bio biological ways, right. With all the crazy stuff on fluidity and gender and stuff, just, just talking about basic human natural theology about being made in the image of God, the creation and the conscious being a witness and those things bring us to account to theism and God as the judge. I think I think Dabney is really strong on that, though sometimes there is an over-reliance on philosophy in his theology. However, his understanding theologically is still very, very rich and very, very good. And again, you can read his book a lot like the set of lectures that, that they are. He connects them really well, but you can read them again in essay form. And I think that the strength of that is that you're going to really understand the low side, the themes of theology effectively. I think the downside of that is that you're not going to see the greater overall theme of the story of the Bible quite as effectively. And I think in a lot of ways you see him basically following the Westminster Confession of Faith and how he um, you know, unfolds his theological plan. Whereas Calvin is working from the Book of Romans when he unfolds his institutes. So there's different methods of how people do things. And Dabney, uh, taking his cue from Francis Tuerton, is going to focus more on the scholastic apologetic method than maybe the, you know, the biblical theology method of Philip Melanchthon, John Calvin, um, and maybe to some degree, even James Henley Thornwell being a little bit more of a biblical theologian than a, than a philosophical apologetic theologian. So Dabney is really good, I think, in public theology in that area in being a witness for Christ, given the, the natural theology that God has given us, and to bring people to account on what is naturally true, what God has in, endowed us with, you know, vested us with on, in reason and consciousness and conscience and in creation. I think he's really strong there. I think obviously he's very weak in the public areas of, of his, his racism. Um, his understanding of the family has, has holds in it. Uh, I think some of his areas of, um, of, of uh, statehood and in understanding, um, t to some level, just his his overemphasis in nationalism, his overemphasis on pride for country, get in the way of his Christianity, in my view. Again, that that's not probably not a, a, a well uh, defended, you know, scholarly opinion. But I just I I think he, he's too invested in that personally. Um, however, he's a very balanced theological thinker. He is always, uh, I think, more balanced and even handed than a lot of the Presbyterians are. He typically has a more moderate view on most things. So you're not going to get real crazy ideas coming from him on fringes of any kind. He's going to really kind of stick to the Westminster Confession of Faith, old school Presbyterianism, old school Calvinism. He's going to give you the business on that. And I, I think, again, Dabney is well known for being a very, very godly man. Um, there's very few people that had bad things to say about him in his life. Um, I, again, he has warts. We do, too. We need to be aware of those warts and we need to not undersell that. We need to not under criticize that. Um, at the same time, we don't need to overreact to his flaws as, as obvious as they are and learn from him his, his just titanic amount of not just knowledge, but precision and grace and understanding. I mean, he was so brilliant that Charles Hodge three times tried to get, to get him to come to Princeton to teach apologetics, church history, and theology at Princeton, but he loved Virginia so much. He wanted to stay at Union Seminary to, to build up the Southern church because there was not a, a, a seminal seminary in his view, though there was Columbia, uh, that he wanted to, to invest his heart and his life there. So th this is a Titan. I think if he would have gone to Princeton, he might be more famous and more popular than Warfield Hodge and, and, um, and others. I think he might be, because I think, I think he's a more balanced, more rigorous uh, theologian across the board. I think I think he's more of a Renaissance man than even Charles Hodge and maybe even B.B. Warfield were. So I think I think he would have been maybe the preeminent even in most of our minds today had he made that move to Princeton, but he did not. And because of that, and along with his his you know obvious warts and problems, he's kind of been dismissed and overlooked for some period of time. So we need to bring back what needs to be brought back, which is his his rigorous philosophical, theological, apologetic work that is very helpful for the believer in in the world today and also the godliness of the man the man was a very very godly man high integrity 
again, could not find very many people that had anything poor to say about him. Um, so he has a huge legacy, I think, that needs to be continued um, and, and, um, and applauded in many ways for the church. So I hope this helps you. I hope this is an, uh, something that might inspire you to buy one or two of his books and, and commend him to you as someone who needs to be, I think, thought through um, um, thoroughly today. So signing off.